Hi, I'm Todd Reingold, the hopeful aspirant. Welcome to another installment of I Got a Testimony. Today's guest is Monique Sawa, and I'm very pleased to have Monique with us today. Monique and I have known each other since middle school, high school, and it's a pleasure to have her on today. And I've been very fortunate in the last couple of weeks that I've been able to reconnect with some people from my past. And it's great to see you. And I want uh, the audience, we're looking forward to hearing your testimony. It's an honor to be here and hopefully um, in the process that lives are touched because that's kind of the goal, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So my grandparents were Catholic. I did believe in praying uh, back then, probably not to the degree that I do now. Um, and I'm not knocking Catholicism. To me, it was very structured and did not feel personal. And I, something deep inside of me always felt like there was something more. Just didn't know how to get there kind of thing. And actually, when I was in um, high school, um, a friend of mine brought me to, it was this uh, fellowship group kind of thing. And they were Pentecostal charismatic type of people and you know again not knocking catholicism because everything your personal relationship is your personal relationship with god and you and people find comfort in different ways for me it was it just didn't feel like it was a fit for me for lack of a better term so got around these people they're praying out they're they're being real they're talking to god they're studying the bible they're they're doing all these things and it's like wow this is different than what i was raised in but when I walked in the doors, it was the type of people that it was Pentecostal holiness. So the women wore dresses all the time, regardless, mm -hmm. no makeup, no jewelry, hair never cut. Well, okay. I wear makeup. I cut my hair. I wear pants, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I like my bling. <laughs> um, you know, So clearly I didn't fit into that. And then I started to feel kind of judged for who I was. Mm -hmm. So I actually ran from God for about 10 years. Okay. So got into marriage number one. Um, and thankfully, I mean, it, it produced a daughter. That's a whole other story that I could touch on, to be honest with you. The man who became my second husband actually had friends and they were like, you know, we want you to come to revival. And at the time I wanted nothing to do with it. I'm chain smoking, going like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not dealing with this. I already dealt with it, blah, blah, blah. So the funny part about the story is I'm sitting there with my then fiance and I'm chain smoking and we're having this argument and I get to like the second to last cigarette. I'm like, oh, man, this tastes terrible. <laughs> and I bash it out into the ashtray and I took the last cigarette in the pack and I broke it up mm. and I never went back. <laughs> I was done. And that was like my confirmation that, you know, okay, Monique, it's time to come back to me. Mm. So we went to the revival. I rededicated my life to, to God and um, was going to this. I actually was at that church for 11 years. During the, the course of the marriage, there were several times where he would like leave and come back. And I thought that because I had committed to this relationship for life, Mm -hmm. that I had to take it. And all that did was just something I've struggled with all my life is my self-esteem. Um, and, you know, this just made it worse. It's like, well, here's a, a, the man who's committed to love me and he's not doing that. Right. And the back and forth, back and forth. Well, at the end of the marriage, things got really tough. Um, and at one point he had left yet again. I came home, everything was gone bank account drained, you know, with his part of it, whatever. And I'm sitting on the couch and I'm crying out, oh my God, either heal this, kill it, or take me because I cannot do this another day. I will not do this another day. I, I'm done. You've got to take it. You've got to figure it out and let me know because I'm done. And I'm in tears. I'm crying. I'm sobbing. And I'm shaking and I'm just like, God, I cannot do this anymore. And after I got done, I had this overwhelming feeling of peace. Uh, it was like I had finally laid it, truly laid it at his feet. I didn't just lay it at his feet and then take it back. Okay, I got this now. We're good. I don't need you. Mm -hmm. 
I truly laid it at his feet that day, that night. Mm -hmm. So week and a half later, as the pattern was, husband wanted to come back. And I finally said, I'm sorry. I cannot do this anymore. If the unbeliever chooses to leave, I can let him go. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was a scripture in the Bible about that. I can't remember which chapter it is. But when you're tied to someone and, it's, and he did stray. Mm -hmm. So th there was the two, I had two reasons and I'm like, and I wasn't looking for the legalities of it. I just wanted to be able to be free. I needed to be set free because I felt like a prisoner in this thing for almost seven years. Mm -hmm. And it was horrid. There were good moments, but they did not weigh the bad ones. And it was just this roller coaster the entire time. Right. And so here I was and I'm like, and the, I hung up that phone and I had peace. And of course, you know, he begged and whatever else. And it was just like, no, I'm done. You, we have to move on with our lives. Right. And I was able to walk away from that with perfect peace. Mm. And I don't condone divorce. Uh, you know, I, I'm not saying, you know, if you can make it work, make it work. But it takes three. It takes you, your spouse, and God. And if you don't have those three things going on, it's not going to work. So you would say that as far as your testimony, uh, bringing that up, is you're saying that for somebody that you really couldn't tear yourself away from, uh, didn't know if you were strong enough, you prayed mm -hmm. about it, you, you prayed about it, you put it on the altar, and just like with the cigarettes, it was like, boom, you, you found your strength in, the, yeah. in that moment. Um, so that's a yeah. powerful testimony, especially 2020, but I'm sure you had dark nights of the soul before 2020. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you maintain your faith in the midst of that? And it was, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. But, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's all, you know, gumdrops and rainbows here. 2020 has been a year for the books for a lot of us. And actually for myself, it's been, the past two years have been pretty intense. Last year in March, my grandmother, who uh, was dealing with Alzheimer's for quite some time, collapsed and was brought into the hospital. She was in such dire shape that they actually had put her into a home afterwards. And during that time, she had made suicidal comments and everything kind of turned upside down. The family was divided it, to kind of back up a little bit. My grandparents raised me from the time I was six years old. And so for me, it wasn't just my grandmother that was going through this. It was mom to me. So this was something that I had a very difficult time with because I was watching someone that was very close to me, one of the smartest and strongest people that I've ever known start to deteriorate right before my eyes. And it was very, very hard. And um, watching her decline, not remember things, get frustrated with herself, um, seeing her health start to decline because she wasn't caring for herself the way she should. So we made the decision as a family to bring her home. And at the time that we did this, um, it was also decided that I would go ahead and move in there and um, help out with her to try to keep her home longer. We were trying to give her a quality of life that she deserved because she'd given us so much. During that time, um, actually, let me back up a little bit. Before um, we, we brought her home from the, the nursing facility, um, after she was out of the hospital, I was in the shower and um, discovered a lump and had to have that addressed. And turned out I had not one to deal with, but two. So in the process of all this, it took six months for me to get cleared. Although I did not have cancer, they still had to treat me a, a certain kind of way because of the way the sizes of the masses. So we dealt with that. And then I also ended up in the hospital from all the stress between work, dealing with my grandmother, the breast scare. Um, and I ended up in the hospital with stroke symptoms. My blood pressure had skyrocketed. And um, so coming out of that and then trying to get myself back on track, in the meantime, helping care for my grandmother, it turned out that this only lasted for a couple of months because she had deteriorated so far that she was night wandering. She wasn't practicing hygiene. She was 
fighting us on everything that we tried to do. So it turned out we ended up having to go the uh, assisted living facility again. And even when you put a family member in a, assisted living, it's not something that you want to do and just forget about them. You still need to be active in there to make sure that they're getting the care that they need. Mind you, I wasn't doing this alone and I wasn't driving it. My, um, uh, my uncle, the middle one, um, was the one who had to take guardianship of her at that point. And I was trying to help him as much as I could because he was trying to, you know, take care of everything with her finances, make sure she was getting the proper care, make sure that all her legal affairs were in, in order and that type of thing. And I had another uncle who had come over from Texas who we both were helping care for her. I was still working. He was retired. So I was kind of like the relief for him. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we kind of, you know, had to work together, try to keep her health up, try to have her eat properly. I was like cooking meals, you know, to make sure that she was getting what she needed. I mean, just because she was older didn't mean that, you know, she should stop trying to care for her right. blood sugar and keep her blood pressure down. I mean, after all, we were trying to give her as much quality of life as we could mm -hmm. in her last days. So she ended up in the facility. We had to get the house ready, get it sold. I had moved yet again. Now I'm finally settled, thank goodness. Um, but then 2020 rolls around. So in March of 2020, my job of 15 years, I'm, I was in the trade show industry. Well, it got completely shut down because of COVID. I mean, COVID took everybody. I mean, everyone has been touched by it, obviously. You know, whether you've had someone sick, been sick yourself, lost someone to it, jobs were lost, businesses closed, all of that. So here I was out of a job. Well, yeah, it kind of gave me a little more time to focus on my grandmother to a point, but guess what? I couldn't go see her because mm -hmm. COVID. So finally in May, they made it so where we could at least have outside visits. Now, in the meantime, here I am realizing that, you know, things are not going to come back in the trade show industry. So I need to get serious about finding work someplace I can call home. And I will tell you, I put out over 300 resumes mm. before this job finally came through and it took five months. So okay. yeah, five months. So in the midst of all of this, my, uh, grandmother took a turn for the worse, and in June, she passed away. We were at the funeral for my grandmother, and my um, my uncle, who was the one taking care of everything, you know, as far as her legal affairs and all that, um, and, you know, being present with her as well, of course, um, he ended up getting COVID and was in the hospital for 10 days, three of them in ICU. Mm -hmm. So, mind you, we've just lost my grandmother. And now my uncle is in serious condition in the hospital. Yeah. And the one that we kind of lean on, he's kind of a rock for us. And here he is helpless and I'm helpless to help him because here's one of my issues right here. I feel like I have to fix it. And guess what? I can't. Right. This, I couldn't fix it with my grandmother. I couldn't fix it with COVID in my job. I could not fix it with my uncle. And when we talk about anxiety, I think sometimes, I'm not saying, how do I say this without sounding callous? There are things that cause us anxiety that we sometimes bring upon ourselves. And I say that in this way. It's not because of the things that happen to us. It's how we take the things that happen to us right. or how we think that we have to fix everything. And guess what? We can't. Right. And so here I am thinking, you know, I got to fix this. I got to make it right. And I'm putting all this pressure on myself and causing myself more anxiety than I should have. And then in July, my other uncle got it. And the one that had been here, had come over here from Texas to help care for my grandmother. He went back to Texas. And in July, the 21st of July, he passed away from COVID. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when I tell you that COVID has touched my life too, yes, it has directly because I lost someone I love dearly to it. So here I am, it, it's August. And after all this, after all hell is broken loose, basically. And I get the call that 
guess what? We want to hire you. <laughs> so, and I'll think, and it was kind of funny because I, um, when I interviewed for the job in my heart, I was like, God, let this one be it. Let this one be it. There's something about this place. I don't know what it is, but I want to be here. And so, um, turned out I got hired and turns out it's a wonderful, wonderful culture, great people, growing company. Um, and I'm really happy there. So I've actually, you know, gotten through my 90 days probation type of thing. And, you know, and I'm starting to build a home after, you know, having to leave a job that I had for almost 15 years. I know you're a person of faith. How did your faith help you to put this in a perspective that you could handle? Okay. Twofold on that. Um, yes, I had to reach out and cry out to God a lot more, um, to get through it because there were times when, you know, it's like, I didn't feel like I could take another step mm -hmm. and it was just like, and, and, you know, I'm crying out to God, God, why am I, why, why am I doing this? You know, what is it you want me to learn from this? What is it you want me to do? How am I going to touch others with this? And, you know, I kept having to do that over and over in October of last year, after I'd done the, the big move, um, into the place that, into the house I'm in now, um, I finally decided that, you know, um, this has been really hard. I'm having trouble coping with it. So I got help. Um, I went to a counselor and turns out she's actually Christian. So it was someone that I could actually talk to who shared my faith mm -hmm. and who also could help me navigate through the anxiety that I was having, the, um, the feeling of being incompetent that I was feeling, um, and all of that. So for a period of months, I went to see her. Um, at first it was once every couple of weeks, and then we went to once a month and it helped me tremendously. She gave me skills to help cope. There was, um, I, I'm sure you've heard of tapping mm -hmm. when you're going through anxiety. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things like the uh, EFT type of thing where you're tapping and you're giving yourself affirmations. Also grounding, you know, taking, um, taking notice of your surroundings and, you know, trying to ground yourself when you're going through that anxiety, because quite frankly, I was going through a lot of it because there was just so much coming at me at one time. Mm -hmm. And so not only was getting the help, because the one thing that people need to realize is that we're not on the, we were not put on this earth to be an island and be alone. I think I touched on that earlier in this conversation and it's true. You've got to reach out and you have to connect because if you don't, you're going to shrivel up and die inside. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, you know, you have to have that, but you have to watch who you connect to because there are times that I would try to talk to someone and, you know, oh yeah, we care about you and we're, you know, we're concerned about you. And then you have the conversation and next thing you know, they're busy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, oh, yeah. um, not everybody can handle it. So you have to be careful about what and how much you share with. Mm -hmm. um, but by the same token, you can't walk around. You got, you, got, you got to learn how to, I had to learn to reframe certain things too. It's not the woe is me. And you know, uh, why is this happening to me? Because if you continue to do that to yourself, it's a downward spiral mm -hmm. and it continues to make you feel more or less worthy, more or less, you know, competent, you know, it's just, it's a downward spiral. And so I had to get to the point where it's like, I had to get up and look in the mirror. It's like, wait a minute. I'm a child of the most high God. Amen. I am worthy of his love. He died on a cross and he forgave me. And he's going to walk. He's been walking me through it this far. He did not bring me this far to abandon me. And sometimes I had to re remind myself of that more than once in a day <laughs> because things were just so hard and so difficult. And when you're sitting in isolation, because our state, we did have a shutdown and I'm sitting here by myself with my failure, so to speak. And, you know, the stuff going on with my grandmother, what am I going to do? And, oh gosh, I'm out of a job. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, not where I want to be physically and, you know, everything, you know, and I'm on my own and what am I going to do? And so that was the time when I really had to put, you know, sometimes on my face before God. And be like, okay, God, I can't anymore. You have to take this. Yep. I can't do it. Life in general is hard as it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't think anybody has it easy. There are going to be seasons where things are difficult. But I can't imagine doing it without my faith. 
even those 10 years where I was like kind of running from God, I would still pray. I still believed. I just wasn't living for him. It took me having to let go and say, okay, God, I'm yours now. Mm -hmm. But even after you say, okay, God, I'm yours now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He, he helped me quit smoking cold Turkey. Boom. No cravings, nothing. I wasn't nasty. I wasn't craving it. Now I can't stand the smell of it to be around it. But then I got married to this man and that I got saved with, you know, rededicate my life with. And that marriage was a roller coaster the whole time. It's okay. like, okay, thank you for helping me get back to God. You were, I had to meet you for a reason that, you know, you helped lead me back to God through your friends. Okay. But it probably should have ended right there. And it didn't. <laughs> now here I am in a place where I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm settled, I've settled into my house and I've got this great job now. And, um, you know, I'm back getting involved in my church again and God kind of put on my heart. It's like, it's time to start getting outside of yourself and start giving affirmation, not just to yourself, but maybe to other people. And maybe with what I'm doing, if it encourages one person, you know, here and another person there, well, I feel like I'm accomplishing what I want to do. And it makes me feel good that I'm doing something that God has put inside me to help encourage others. And, you know, something that you touched on, you know, you want to be able to work for God and take what you know and your, your experience and help people with it. And when we get outside of ourselves and get the focus off of ourselves, we kind of, we get that connection and we get to experience more of God's best because we're sharing that knowledge and that love that he's put inside of us. Safe to say, you're probably a better person than I am. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, I, I really do want to help people. It's in my heart to do. I know what it's like to suffer and to suffer as you have. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, for anyone who's watched more than one of my shows, I talk about anxiety in almost every show. And mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not proud of it. I hate it. But just like an alcoholic, you have to admit you have a problem in order to deal with the problem. Exactly. And this show helps me as much as it, I believe, serves others. And one of my reasons for, for doing it and committing to it the way I have is because I feel better when I'm in the Lord. And now there's always that part of me, because I wasn't raised up in this, there's always mm -hmm. that part of me that's kind of saying, you don't really believe this. You know, right. Right. You're, you're not a nice person and nah, you know, you're going to get found out and you have all these terrible things that go on in your head. And if people knew, and it's like Paul literally said, why do I think things I don't want to think? Mm -hmm. Why do I do things I don't want to do? Yep. And, and this is the Apostle Paul saying this. And I'm certainly not on his level. I wasn't raised to believe in an enemy. Uh, but I do believe that the enemy is real. And that's how I know. Because he right. never stops chattering in my head. And when I talk to people and I say, well, you know that voice in your head that always tells you you're, you're not attractive enough. You're not smart enough. Yeah. Yep. You're going to get found out. Uh -huh. And people, some people will look at me and go, no. And I go, you, you don't have that. You don't have a voice condemning you constantly or judging mm -hmm. everyone that walks by you. No. And I'm like, well, God bless you. I mean, Oprah's talked about it. Wayne mm -hmm. Dyer's talked about it. Tony Rod. I mean, all these people I respect admit to this. That but look at what they're doing, Todd. That's why. Because when you do something, when you're actually doing something, mm -hmm. that's when you're going to face the most adversity. What I want to know from you is that process. How do you stay in faith? What do you actually do? I start listening to, you know, like Clint Brown or I listen to Hill, Hillsong. One of my favorites is Hillsong. Mm -hmm. Some of the lyrics that they have and it's like digging really deep, you know, like from the inside out. Um, I am who you say I am. Um, trying to reassure myself of who I am, regardless of what I'm going through. Um, those are songs. And as I start going, getting myself into the actual songs, you know, I'm listening to it first. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And then it starts kind of getting into my spirit mm -hmm. because what you feed yourself with during these times is going to determine your outcome. When you are going through the darkest of times and the worst of your times, you sometimes have to shut everything and everything else down and just shift your focus. Because you're so bogged down, your stomach's in nuts, your heart's, your, your chest is hurting because you're just, you're all cried out. You're all, you know, it feels impossible. 
if you have a church to go to, I suggest going. Thinking about the audience, what would you say to somebody who's going through a real tough time right now to encourage them in a real way based on what you know about God, about whatever has blessed you, what would you say to those viewers to help them to keep on keeping on? When you think you can't go on another step, that's when you have to stop yourself and say, okay, I don't got this, God, you have to do it. And it's that letting go part that is the hardest thing to do. One of the things that my, my bishop likes to touch on, you know, praise will help you get through just about anything. And if you turn your situation around and start praising him, the God that created you, praising him for what he's done, praising him for where you are. I mean, even through my roughest time, it's like, okay, I don't have a job, but I still have food on my table. I still have a roof over my head. I still have family members that love me. I have these beautiful grandchildren. So I started praising God for what I had. Mm -hmm. And when you start praising God for what you have, all of a sudden, you start seeing other things that you actually have. Well, you know, I praise God that I have this person in my life. I praise God that I get to drive this car. It's a, it's a newer vehicle. And it's, it's pretty nice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, and then praising God for having this job. Well, I kind of had to do the same thing on my way to work. It's like, okay, well, if I'm praying, if I'm having all this music and I'm doing all this stuff that actually praise and glorifies him, well, guess what? My day at work actually went pretty good mm -hmm. because here I was, my focus was I'm, I'm praising the creator for what he's done for who he is and what he's given me. And all of a sudden, here's my day. It's not too bad. Yeah. And every day that I've done that, I've gotten through it all right. When they talk about the sacrifice of praise, mm -hmm. when you're going through, that praise is a sacrifice. Oh, yeah. But if you do it, it will bless you. I want to thank Monique for being on the show today. It's been really a joy to listen to you and for you to share your personal experiences with us. I really do appreciate it. This is Todd Reingold, The Hopeful Aspirant. Let's all aspire to reach higher and stay inspired.